So if we think back to the introduction to limits, the very first um, section, when we looked at limits, right, we looked at different ways that a limit might fail to exist. And this is one of the scenarios that we considered. We said, okay, um, if our function is approaching more than one value when we're, when we're close to this point C, um, then the limit can't possibly exist, right? And typically the way you end up with a function approaching more than one value is that the values that f of x is close to on one side of the point are different from the values that f of x is close to on the other side of the point. Right? There's also you know, the, these kind of really wild situations like sine of 1 over x where it jumps all over the place. Um, but this is a more typical example, right? So the limit doesn't exist because the function approaches different values depending on the direction um, you're approaching, right? And so this idea of, of approaching different values depending on direction from the left or from the right, uh, there's language for this. We make this precise because you, you might recall that if you try to explain in your own words why it is that the limit doesn't exist in a context like this, um, it's a little bit tricky to come up with the right words to explain why exactly is it um, that there is no limit here, right? We can, we can come up with something, but it's, it's, it's harder than you might think. So what we do is we talk about limits from the left, and we talk about limits from the right. Okay, uh, or if you like, uh, you'll often see the language used here of left-hand limit and right-hand limit. So informally, what we're going to do is we're, we're basically going to repeat, you know, the, the concept of the limit that we already have, right, the idea of the limit. Um, but rather than just saying, you know, x approaches c, we're going to say, well, x approaches c from the left or from the right. Okay, we're going we're gonna to make this distinction between coming in from one direction or the other direction. Okay, so the way we write this is we would say, so the limit from the left, we would say, same as before, limit as x approaches c of f of x. Okay, and for the right, the limit as x approaches c of f of x. And we make one small modification to the notation, right? Um, so if we, if we want to say that we're coming from the left, right, that means that we're looking at values of x which are close to c, but they're a little bit less, okay? And, and so a little bit less, well, we can say, you know, we can use, let's say, a minus sign, right, to say less, right? So it's C minus a little bit, if you like, all right? From the right, we want a little bit more. So C plus a little bit, right? So that little minus plus sign tells us um, that we're dealing with the limit um, from either the left or from the right. Now, let's say that this has a particular value, right? Let's say this is some limiting value L1. Maybe this is some limiting, you know. So they might be different, like we see here, right? There might be two different limits, right? So what do we mean when we say that the limit of f of x as x approaches c from the left is L1, or as x approaches c from the right, that the limit is L2? What do we mean? Well, let's think about, you know, what do we mean when we say that the limit as x approaches c for f of x equals L, right? Um, so we go through the whole, you know, the whole business of, you know, for any epsilon greater than zero, there is, you know, this uh, delta greater than zero, such that, all right? And, and in all three cases, the goal is the same, all right? We want to conclude that the difference between f of x and, and L, right? or L1, or L2, whatever the limit happens to be, we want to make that difference smaller than epsilon. So in the regular definition of the limit, right, 
So this is this notion of we can make f of x close to L, right? For those of you that don't spend that much time on the, on the precise definition. Um, so here we would say if the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, right? But also bigger than 0 because we don't actually let x equal to a, okay? So one of the things you might notice is that in here there's kind of two possibilities, right? We're considering, uh, oh, sorry, uh, x minus c. We're considering two options here. We're considering that either, so either c minus delta is less than x less than c, right? Or the other possibility is that c is less than x is less than c plus delta, okay? Those are the two ways that we could, we could satisfy that inequality, right? So in the regular limit, we're asking for both of those to hold. In the left and right-hand limits, we only ask for one or the other, right? So here, this becomes simply c minus delta less than x less than c. In the right-hand limit, it becomes c less than x less than c plus delta, okay? All right. So we're still saying that x is close to c, right? Because we still have to be within delta. But you'll see that here we're only allowing for x to be a little bit less than c. Here we're only allowing for x to be a little bit more than c, okay? Otherwise, it's the same limit definition that we've, we had all along, okay? And there's one important result that comes out of this. And it gives us that language we need to talk about situations like this, okay? And the theorem says, and again, I'm just going to do shorthand here. The theorem says that the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals L if and only if the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x equals L and the limit as x approaches c from the right of f of x equals l, okay? So if, if both one-sided limits exist and they're equal, then that common limiting value is the limit, right? Conversely, if the limit exists, then you know that both one-sided limits have to exist and they have to agree with the overall limit, okay? So that's what the theorem is saying. Um, and, and it's kind of easy to see when you look at the definition that this is, this is true, right? Um, if, if this limit exists, right, if we can find this delta that makes f of x minus l um, smaller than epsilon, well, then these two conditions, they, you know, they, they both hold, right? So we can have one or the other, right? If we take this one, we get the left-hand limit. If we take that one, we get the right-hand limit, okay? On the other hand, um, if we know that the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit both exist and they're both equal, right, then whichever of these two deltas happens to be smaller, we take that as the delta in the overall limit definition, and then we know that the limit exists, right? So now when you're, when you're faced with a situation like this and somebody says, okay, explain why the limit does not exist, now you have the language to do that. You can say, well, the limit doesn't exist because the left-hand limit is equal to three, the right-hand limit is equal to one because the left and right-hand limits are not equal, the limit doesn't exist, 